Hello, welcome to Teaching RSG with Courtney J. Body. That's me. This is a podcast that celebrates artists and advocates for community engagement. And like you, I'm home and looking to connect. And so we have launched this video series of the podcast called Keep Making Art, where we talk to creatives who are making and sharing art or uh, they're guiding or advocating for others to make and share art. If you haven't already, subscribe to the YouTube channel, check it out, lots and lots of episodes there. We're also on, uh, you know, all the social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, I guess that's not all of them, but still, you know what I'm saying. So let's get to our guest for today. Let me introduce you all to Dr. Sean Ginwright. Hi, Sean. Hello, hello, Courtney, how are you? Oh my goodness, I am so very excited to have you. I'm, I'm pretty good today. How are you and your family? We're doing well, we're doing well, um, just uh, navigating this shelter in place in California. Yeah, so we're on opposite sides of the, of the country, different coasts, um, and, and can you help us understand what your role and what, what your role is and what field you are working in? Uh, uh, professionally, I'm an educator. I'm a professor of Africana Studies and Education at San Francisco State University, and um, I'm, a, I'm the CEO of Flourish Agenda, where we really help schools and community organizations and any institution or system working with youth. We help them to really uh, have an impact on um, healing young people who've experienced trauma. Mm -hmm. And um, what's the, so tell us more about the mission of Flourish Agenda. Well, our mission really is um, to create a pathway for, for healing the world. Um, we believe that um, everybody has the right to flourish and that our institutions, our institutions in this country just need a path to show folks how to do it. Um, and that means not just young people, but also the adults who work in these systems uh, really need um, permission and a pathway to, to uh, transform their lives so that they can show up in more humane ways for young people. Oh, um, and so I first um, met you, I think about four or five years ago, maybe, um, where you were a keynote speaker at a, a National Guild conference. I, be I believe it was in Chicago. And since then, I've been, um, a, shall we say, a groupie slash friend slash whatever. <laughs> and you've been a guest on the podcast, um, which is a very popular episode of Beat the Dubs. Um, uh, but you, you talk about so, so much of what I've learned from you really permeates and is, is well woven into the ways that I, I try to operate while I'm still um, challenged by making sure that I apply the same kinds of healing practices that I want for the communities that we work with um, as, as self-care as well. So we are all in the same situation, right? Except... Um, uh, it can be, it can feel quite inequitable in terms of what the situation can be for each individual. And so I'm just curious about um, what, what you and, and Flores Agenda's response has been to the health crisis. Yeah, well, we've, we've responded in a, in a couple of ways. Um, you know, one really immediate way that we've responded is we recognize that, um, that you know, this, this, um, this issue, this disease, this virus has disproportionately impacted black and brown communities. And we know that there's disproportionality in um, death rates and the, the rates of, of uh, reports of actually having the disease. But there's also actually a much more egregious way that we see this, and that is families who aren't able to work and families who are already on paycheck to paycheck um, and now are unable to meet the gap between the um, paycheck protection program and their and their employer. So we are fortunate to have a few donors um, here in California that we said, hey, uh, they came to us actually and said, we don't want to give this money to a community foundation so that they can get it out and they take a cut. Can you guys get this money to families? And Nedra, my wife, who's brilliant. Um, said, yeah, we know lots of families who can use a significant um, amount of, you know, can use money uh, to make ends meet. And so we created something called the Flourish Fund, which is really a fund that's used to give out money to families 
with no strings attached. This is your money. Do what you want to do with it. The, we give between $1,000 and $1,500. Um, you go online, you fill out an application, and it, uh, the money gets transferred to you via PayPal or Zelle, um, and you have the money. And we're trying to cut out all the bureaucracy and give people money because they need it, period. So that's one way we're responding. That's beautiful. Um, I will talk to you offline about some other ideas that are popping in my head right now. But I, I you know, from my perspective, I, I can only, what am I trying to say? I am challenged because I want to be able to uh, recognize the realities of what this pandemic is, is doing to families, to individuals. Um, but I also have a job around the arts, right? And so um, I'm constantly sort of trying to um, balance those two things where I think that um, being able to offer arts uh, uh, resources can help on, a, on an emotional level, can help with trauma, um, but there's also the reality that we're still in this situation too, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, under, understanding one, that, you know, yes, communities of color are disproportionately affected by this um, and were already disproportionately affected in terms of econ economics and uh, socioeconomics. And, um, and from another perspective that can also include many people from the, the uh, communities of color are artists, also a very fragile, vulnerable, community in, in this uh, in, in regular normal times, as well as this very, very uh, intense and serious time. And so I, I'm curious also about, I guess, where, I guess what I'm asking, I, I, sorry, that whole point is based off of what I want to talk to you about later, about how we can think about the fact that there are plenty of families who, who uh, you know, with incomes coming from the creative community, Mm -hmm. um, and have not have lost their work. Uh, how do we find ways to support them in the same way that you all have been able yeah. to figure out how to do yeah, yeah, yeah. communities within your your region? Um, so that was my point there. Sorry, I was going off on another thing, but um, I guess I guess that's where my brain is also going towards is, is trauma. You talk a lot about in a very um, clean and clear way to me that has resonated. I'm wondering if you could share with everybody about what the effects of trauma um, can, can be for an individual or a community. Yeah, so, you know, so, so I think um, I'm going to back up and then answer your, your question, right, which is because I think the context of how I'm answering it matters. And so whether we like it or not, in the near future, we will be in a post-COVID world. We will, we will figure it out, time will come, we're gonna, we're gonna get to a post-COVID world and everything is gonna have changed, right? And so the question to me is not if we're gonna get to post-COVID, it's the, the question really is, is we're in old world now, we know those rules don't work. We know that the hustle, the bustle, we know that structural inequality and racism and, and othering, we know all that doesn't work. So the real question for each of us is, what are we going to leave behind in the old world and what are we going to bring into the new one? And that question is both an individual question and a collective question. So your question about trauma um, really is about what are we leaving behind in the old world and what are we going to bring into the new one? Because at this moment, we have the capacity, the collective capacity to, to really rewrite the rules in ways that benefit all people. But if we only respond to the crisis, which we need to do, if we only respond, right? If we only just think about responding, reacting, responding, reacting, the rules will be rewritten in the same way that reproduces inequality. And so our, the, 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 the challenge for us now is to both respond and imagine. We have to do both of those things. And so what that looks like in terms of around trauma and healing is that the, the, I read somewhere, I think, you know, you, I find myself 
surfing Twitter a lot, you know, whatever, you know, not Twitter, it was Instagram, I saw this quote, right? And I, and I forget who, it, who said it, but I thought it was really good. Uh, the quote said, the only difference between trauma and healing is that in trauma, you don't get to choose how you respond to it, how you respond to your hurt. But in healing, you get to choose. You get to choose how you want to respond. You, wanna, you get to choose who you want to be. You get to choose how you want to show up. And that's agency, that's healing. And so I think in this national traumatic experience that we experience as a nation, that the question really is about what are we choosing to bring into this new world and who we choose to become, right? And to be a healing-centered nation or to integrate and engage in the healing, is, it really comes down to that question. And so I think the role of artists play a critical role in this, into this, right? And that means that we can't presume that certain kinds of so problems can be solved by certain kinds of people, right? Or certain kinds of professions. It means that, you know, we know that the reason we didn't have a healthcare system that provided the kind of necessity for all people we know that that doesn't work. So now the question is, is who's gonna, what kinds of people should be at the table? Should people who didn't have healthcare be at the table? Should people um, who, who, who are working class be at the table and making decisions and policies that best meet their needs? I think the time for rethinking the rules are, 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 has come and um, the role of artists, I think, are, plays a critical role into really engaging and leaning into that kind of a question. You're, I think you're on mute. <laughs> I, I'm not on mute. I'm crying. Um, that's what's happening because okay. I, I love like you're just so eloquent in how you're saying like literally everything that's in my head and heart. Um, and I, I, that's exactly what I've been asking everybody who's been a guest on here is like, how do we mobilize? How do we activize? activate but really what i'm saying is how do we make sure that the people who haven't been at the tables have a seat at the table when we are making the decisions about what we leave behind and how we change and i love what you just said about really shifting from this you know you do it by your own you pull your bootstraps or or your your kind of shit out of luck situation and actually thinking about being being a healing centered society to me, I've seen, I feel like I've seen on a national scale, some examples of that um, in New Zealand, um, very specifically after Christchurch, but also in this moment, that country has no new cases. And everything that they did in, in response was from this healing centered uh, point of view and action bearing. Um, and and I, don't know if, <laughs> I don't know if we had talked about this before, when, when you were a guest, but everything that you're saying to me uh, sounds very very similar to this this working theory that I have around a term that I I I I've been trying to sort of uh, turn <laughs> or de define at, uh, through these conversations called feminarchy. And to me, feminarchy is it it, it I think the official de definition is like ruling by women, but that's not what it, I don't think that's what it means. I think it's about putting people first. It's people at the center making your choices based on people and not about businesses or money or whatever, but actually thinking about what do the people need? How do we help each other? How do we build this collective human humanizing society? Um, and that's something that I've been, that theory has been be become a huge anchor for me. And quite frankly, I feel like I've been having these conversations about shifting paradigms and shifting, you know, shifting systems and, and, and always thinking sort of on a smaller micro scale. But now is the, the time, the reset button is literally here. And if we don't, you're right, I, the old world versus the new world, I want a world where I want to live in a world and I want to be a part of a world and help to build a world that is from this healing place of mm -hmm. love. I, I think, um, you know, I think that, first of all, feminism in general and womanism in particular have a great deal to offer how to reshape an ethic of a democracy, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and the principles of a feminist or a womanist 
um, theory or perspective really boils down to how do we enact a beloved community in one where we can treat all people as human beings mm -hmm. and a democracy that enshrines that idea is, our, is still our goal. And so your notion of a fem, feminine, a fem democracy, I can't remember the term, feminarchy. right? Feminarchy. Feminarchy, feminarchy. Right, a feminarchy is, <laughs> I think is, is, is entirely like what is needed and what we should be advancing, right? And, um, you know, part of, um, and I'm just kind of rambling here, so I don't know if there's I a love it. I'm talking right now. I just, I just got off of, um, I'm doing these interviews from, for the, my new book. And one of the premises in the book called Pivot is a pivot from a life of hustle to flow. And, and that, that it means that we have to decouple our, our culture and our decouple our spirit from what capitalism does to us. And what capitalism does is that it commodifies our humanity. Mm. And, it, and, it, and it tells us that we value a human being by what a human being can earn or produce. And what that does is that it, 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 it shapes our day, it shapes your day, Courtney, because you have hella to-do list, you're on calls, you are, if you weren't in shelter in place right now, you probably had 10 meetings today and 10 tomorrow, and we are just on this ongoing frenzy of a life that doesn't allow us to reflect and think about and dream and imagine what we want. So this pivot from hustle from, from hustle to flow means that we slow down and that that slowing down roots us in our indigenous wisdom in ways that can bring to bear contemporary problems. But if we don't slow down, guess what we do? We continue to borrow the tools that created the damn problem in the first place. So uh, uh, the interview that I was just in, uh, his name is Ben McBride, he's brilliant. You should have him on your show. Um, he said that uh, it's just a, an amazing story. He said, Ben McBride said um, that there's this story about how people, you know, years and years ago used to build cathedrals. And when they would start building a cathedral, they built it because they knew it would take, they would build it with the knowledge that it would take a hundred years to complete. And his question was, what kind of mind does it take to start building a cathedral that they know that they will never step foot into? They had a mind that was decoupled from capitalism because they knew that they can start something that the next generation would pick it up, the next generation would pick it up, and then finally the next generation would be able to enjoy the magnificence of something that they created 100 years ago. So the question I think for us and the question that he poses is what are we working on? That we don't expect to see in our lifetime, but that 100 years from now our children will say thank you. And so I think that is the role of a healer. That is the role of an artist. That is the role of our justice movements. Our, our role is not only to react to what's in front of us, but to lean into a courageous imagination of what we want. And that is, that's not, you know, I know it sounds fluffy, but this is what social change is about, right? It's about leaning into the possibility of what can be. And I, again, this is, this is, um, you know, a conversation I'm fresh in my mind with uh, Ben McBride. So um, I think that's, and I don't know if I mean asking your question, Courtney. <laughs> so <laughs> sorry, I got to stay focused. Here. What you're talking about, I've heard before from indigenous uh, people in the indigenous community about how what you're doing now you should be thinking about seven generations ahead of you. So that idea of a hundred years. So you may be weaving and making something now that you will not see the, the fruits of those labors until seven generations from now, but that's actually your responsibility. Um, so that, that's what it's reminding me. I've heard that from Ty Defoe, who's also been a guest um, on the podcast. And, and, and sometimes, I don't, I don't mean to cut you off, but sometimes, um we have the sort of arrogance <laughs> to believe, and I, and I don't know if it's arrogance, maybe that's not the right word, 
but we don't have we have the arrogance and the imp and maybe combined with the impatience to believe that all the changes that are necessary we will see and if that's if all of our justice is in that realm if it's all of it's in that space a lot of it needs to be in that space we need to respond but if all of it's in that space are we really are we really doing social justice work or are we only doing responsive justice work mm -hmm. right i was thinking yes yes i'm with you i'm just wondering if that idea i mean we know how deeply embedded white supremacist patriarchal societies and norms are in our society. And so I'm wondering when you said arrogance, I was immediately what, what sprang to my head was like, yeah, of course we do that because that's, that is the, that is how this society actually is based. That's what it's based on right now. And we don't necessarily always realize those things, you know, because we're, because we have a very specific image when you say those words, right? It's a very specific image, but actually the culture of it the idea of perfectionism, the idea of um, it's all or nothing, the idea of, um, you know, it's us versus them, that kind of things are very inherent and that's been, like, literally we've been brought up this way, whether we realize it or not. And so now I, I love what you're saying. I love what, let's, let's think about it like a pie, right? So if you've got like a large section, maybe three quarters of it has to be responding right now what's the, the other, you know, uh, fourth that we're thinking of and doing that imagining. And so, so, so what I've been trying to do is in that imaginative space while I'm still having to respond and gosh, I have so much to respond to, but I'm also being asked to imagine. I'm asked, I'm being asked to do that work. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's for a, a business venture and that totally makes sense because that's going to keep our, our business viable and employ people and also it completely makes sense. But then thinking about this, about society and civics and, 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 and how we can imagine from that perspective, my query is about how, how do we do that? Because we already know that in terms of the three quarters part where there is response that's happening, there are policymakers who are trying to be in that sort of imagined state, but they're, they're collecting people or they're convening people that are, that I think are missing people. Like, I, something sent me something that the mayor's like council or committee on looking at education didn't include a teacher, didn't include anybody. I mean, I guess the chancellor's going to be on it, but like what you just talked about before about like the blue collar worker, the person who doesn't have the job, the person who's an artist, where are they at the table? And I don't understand beyond, you know, those, what they do, what do they do? They have public hearings. Right, that's not the that's not the place because by the time you have the public hearing, often the decision has actually already been made. So who's yeah. planning? Who's a part of the planning teams and having that wide ranging perspective so that when you come up with a plan, it actually is taking all the people and, and yeah. situations into consideration. So I'm asking about mobilization, I guess. I'm asking for how do we get a freaking seat at the table? <laughs> yeah. Um... Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to Brother Ben McBride, because um, I just think his, his, his words are really brilliant. He, he says that sometimes activists always begin with the wrong question, which is, the wrong question is, what do we need to do? And the right question is, who do we need to become? And, um, you know, I, and I, when I heard him say that for the first time, it kind of like kind of shook me because exactly I think that is the exact question because right now the rules of what is what is happening I think are are shifting up underneath our feet, right? I, I said, um, you know, could you imagine in January, um, you know, you know, you you feel and you still feel the toxic political environment between Republicans and Democrats, right? It's almost like saying you're the devil and you're Hitler, right? It's like, you know, to say that I'm a Democrat or to say that I'm Republican is a, an attack upon my, your perception of someone's values and humanity. When, when in fact, it's really just a political party, but not in America right now. It's when you say I'm a Republican, you assume that I'm a bad person, 
I'm just going to cut to the chase, right? When it's, that's not really what, what it is, but we couldn't have imagined if I would have said in January, you think the Republicans and the Democrats could come together to pass the largest $2 trillion bill? You think they can do that in two weeks? No one would have said, are you kidding? It wouldn't take two years. We wouldn't be able to do that. But they did it in two weeks. Now, of course, you could debate on why they did it, and it was self-preservation of capitalism. You could, whatever. That might be true. But it happened. And my point is, is that it would have been impossible to think about that in January. It would have been impossible to think about that in December. But it happened, and it happened in like two weeks. So my point is, is that, yes, there is an opportunity to get to the table. Um, but we have to get to the table in a way that doesn't just re re uh, doesn't just replace the throne with our values. We have to actually take away the throne. So it's not just a, it's just not having a seat at the table. Is that maybe we don't even need a table because it precludes that it's not a that that some people could be at the table and others cannot. So. But my, and I don't know if I'm being really confusing here, but my point is, is that it's not about just having a seat at the table, because if we had a seat at the table without transforming who we become, we then reproduce those same cultural values, those same values that oppressed us, because now we got the power and we're going to take care of our kind, because we haven't become yet. We are the same people. Now we're the same people with power because we haven't questioned the damn table in the first place. So, my, so his point, which I'm trying to share, is we have to transform who we become. And, who will be, and when we transform that, we'll determine if there should be a table or not. I can't. Courtney, are you on mute? I can't hear you. Uh -oh. Okay, now it's, now it's back. Okay, okay. Uh, no, I'm also talking low, so that, that might make part of it. It's because I'm thinking, you're making me think, uh, which is good. You, you made me feel today. <laughs> you're making me think because I'm asking a question about how do I get, how do we get to the table? And you're telling me, no, no, that's not, that's not the question. You should be asking, who are we becoming? And that's big. That's big. Uh, and I need to think about that. And I, and I think artists in particular, as opposed to politicians, um, as opposed to physicians, as, a, as opposed to um, policymakers and think tanks, have a great deal to say about that question, yeah. or should have a great deal to say about that question, about who, who, who are we becoming and how, and how should we do that, in particular. Um, it is the only pr profession that I know where you are encouraged not only to think different, but to think about what's impossible and make it believable. And you do that regularly. Right? So I, I, think, I think the role of an artist is to lean into that ability to take, some, to take that which is unimaginable, impossible, and to convince people otherwise, right? Because that's what artists do. So I'm gonna close with, uh, um, I'm gonna close with something I don't think I have the rights to, but I'm, I'm not gonna show it, but I'm gonna talk about it. I just need to look it up before I say it. But uh, I was inspired by um, a piece uh, that was on the, the uh, PBS Hour um recently maybe within the last week or so and i said something i sort of shared it on the facebook i'm trying to find it um I, I recommend people watching it and it was this writer who said you know when when i'm i'm stuck or or have an issue that i can't quite find my way through i do this mindfulness exercise where um i i the, the issue has been solved i talk through how it got solved and so she goes through, she goes through this um, about the post post pandemic life. So what you said earlier about post um, like the post pandemic will happen. It's a matter of when, 
and who will we become leaving the you know old old world here it is um yeah so it's a, a humble it's called a humble opinion on a successful post-pandemic world mm. and the way that she uh describes it i think there is an artistic or creative response to this idea and i would i'm interested in trying to figure out how do i sort of say i said it on facebook you know just on my own little page but i think that there's a campaign here and and your question from dr mcbride dr mcbride ben, yeah ben mcbride ben, sorry, excuse me ben mcbride um is about who are we it's it's it, that in question who are we becoming who will we become who should you know who are we become that it that, that those two things to me are are quite connected or interconnected I don't know if I have a question. Well, I'm going to I'm going to look at I'm going to look. I thought you were going to read the read the read the passage, it's a, but it's a short. It's a short. It's a video. Actually, gonna, it's, it's on short, your it's on your web page. It is. I'll, I'll send it to you. But yeah, yeah it's, I'd love it's on to the see web page, it. and it's very interesting, and it and it, it's delightful because there's another one that I've seen too from Tom Foolery that um, is a little bit more controversial. It's called The Great Realization. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it's like beautifully told, but, um, uh, it's, uh, it's, um, it's, it's British. So, <laughs> so it's just different because, you know, this is where we live. So Sean, I, I can't, I literally can't. You always inspire me. You're, you're so intelligent and I like wish I could be in every single room that you are in at all times. So I can continue <laughs> to learn and be better. Um, so thank you so much for spending time with me and our audience and for giving us some real, real big things and ideas to think about. Thank you for the invitation, Courtney. You know, you know, you got me, girl. I'll do whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. And thank you all for watching. And remember to keep, uh, oh, oh, no, remember, if you haven't already, we are also recording this for the podcast, so subscribe on uh, SoundCloud or Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And remember to keep making art.